friends i am dr amdekar in this video i am going to recap the important messages that my colleagues gave over the last 7 videos all related to anatomical localization in neurology dr chokani first talked about the muscle tone and he said it could be an active muscle tone or a passive muscle tone and then he emphasized that hypotonia could also be non neurological as in the case of severe malnutrition or associated with hypermobility syndrome as a benign congenital hypotonia which would improve over time with physiotherapy of course the lower motor neuron lesion uh, needs to hypotonia uh, besides a loss of power and a reflexia and the uh, anatomical localization could be right from the anterior horn cell down to the roots the nerves the neuromuscular junction and muscle while the increased muscle tone could be a pyramidal tract involvement like a class knife spasticity or it could be rigidity uh, due to a basal ganglia involvement and also dystonia a twisting characteristic of that increased muscle tone in the next video dr kare discussed about hemiplegia and he made a strong point that in pediatric practice in particular a presentation of a monoplegia could be a part of a hidden hemiplegia and you need to be very cautious in evaluating the other limb involvement if any he then discuss about the anatomical localization with the cortical involvement you often have encephalopathy and a seizure with subcortical involvement is often asymmetrical and with involvement of basal ganglia the internal capsule involvement is a dense hemiplegia with upper motor neuron facial palsy and down there in the midbrain you have a cross hemiplegia with third and fourth cranial nerve involvement with the pons the sixth seventh cranial nerve involvement and the medulla the lower cranial nerve involvement he also discuss about the cervico medullary anatomical localization causing involvement of both upper limbs but sparing the lower limbs and even rarely a spinal lesion itself where at the site of lesion below C5 you may get a lower motor neuron finding and below that the upper motor neuron thereafter dr sridhar ganpati talked about paraplegia and he said that paraplegia may also be upper motor neuron presenting with only increased tone and a babinski positive as happens in a slowly enlarging lateral ventricles but often it would be a spinal lesion and the spinal lesion again could be a transverse myelitis affecting both motor sensory as well as the bladder and bowel involvement whereas it could be commonly due to a compression either extradural intradural or intramedullary and he made the differences of all that and saying that intramedullary is often a benign lesion extramedullary often comes from nearby structures like a tubercular spine and of course the intramedullary are not so common they are pretty rare amounting to only 5% of them thereafter dr tushar maniar discuss about ataxia and he said it's an instability which could be cerebellar or a posterior column and rarely even a vestibular which may simulate like an ataxia and then he went on to say that the rhombic sign which means that you test the child's instability with eyes closed and eyes open would differentiate between a posterior column lesion and a cerebellar lesion besides that the cerebellar lesion may involve vermis or the lobes and you may have not only the truncal ataxia but even the intentional tremors nystagmus etc thereafter dr mahesh mohit had discussed about drowsiness and he said that a drowsiness gradually worsening into coma could arise from either a brain stem lesion or a bilateral cortical lesion he emphasized that a unilateral cortical lesion can go on expanding and also interfere with the normal 
hemisphere of the brain and then therefore present with a bilateral hemispheric drowsiness. He also said that a doll's eye sign can differentiate between a brainstem lesion and a higher cortical lesion. Thereafter, I myself came on to discuss about the optic nerve localization. And I made a point that while this may be the second important cranial nerve often involved, it involves acuity of vision, color vision, field of vision, and fundus examination, but I wanted to make a special stress on field of vision. Of course, the acuity of vision is more often an ophthalmological examination, and the fundus is often seen also by the neurologist. But when it comes to the field of vision abnormality, one can clinically, bedside, try to assess, and it could be a screening test, which can help you to decide whether you want to consult an ophthalmologist or maybe a neurologist. And I did discuss about the confrontation test where you sit across about a meter from the patient. The patient keeps his left eye open and you as an examiner keep your right eye open and then you move your arm and the finger from lateral to the medial side and see whether what you can see correlates with what the patient also can see. Friends, then I went on to localize the optical lesion like it could be the optic nerve itself present complete uh, blindness or it could be further down to optic chiasma and I made a special reference to optic chiasma which can present with homonymous temporal hemianopia and often it may be caused by structures near about chiasma like a pituitary or a hypothalamic tumor and thereafter the optic radiation and the primary visual cortex causing visual defects on the contralateral side. I also made a point that often the visual defects may not be complete but partial depending on which fibers in that area are involved. And in the last video of this series, Dr. Palni Raman discussed about localization of the seven nerve palsy and he said that upper motor neuron of course involves only the lower half of the face whereas the lower motor neuron involves entire face is involved on the same side but he also said that the pontine lesion which is the nuclear lesion often has a six nerve along with the seven and often the cerebellar sign because the nerve exits out of the cerebellopontine angle and then he made a special reference to internal auditory meatus seven nerve involvement where it being a very small canal you might have to use steroids in order not to leave behind any sequelae which otherwise the facial nerve paralysis almost often improves. Friends, then this was the entire series of anatomical localization of neurology and in the next series we are going to discuss a neurodevelopmental issues and I will come back again discussing largely about the importance of head size involvement. I hope you are enjoying our YouTube channel and please spread the news to your colleagues and I hope you continue to be with us. Thank you very much.